His most important paleontological uh, discoveries were south of Ulaanbaatar at a place called the Flaming Cliffs. Andrews wrote of a majestic canyon that seemed to shout tongues of fire in the evening light. The locals call this Bayan Zach, which means rich in Zach. Zach is that little uh, tree that you see over there, and it makes really good firewood, burns a long time. Roy Chapman Andrews came here, and he renamed this the Flaming Cliffs. Roy Chapman Andrews had a great flair for the dramatic. When I was a little boy, I read about this place. Roy Chapman Andrews was a hero of mine because I really loved dinosaurs. I used to have a little book uh, that I remember. It was called The Real Book of Dinosaurs. And in that, it introduced me to Roy Chapman Andrews and the fact that he found the dinosaur eggs. Roy Chapman Andrews got out of college and he immediately went to work for the American Natural History Museum in New York. There he was primarily used as a taxidermist. They started sending him out on expeditions though to collect specimens and during World War I he was in the Navy in naval intelligence specializing in Asia. He didn't come out here looking for dinosaurs. In fact his expedition was supposed to be looking for the missing link. There's nothing out here today. There's no museum. There's no dig going on. We're out here just to see what he saw and the terrain that he saw. And there are still fossils being washed out here. There are fresh ones all the time. Something to keep in mind is that these were wild and lawless times in Mongolia with revolutions all around the country. Roy Chapman Andrews was not a paleontologist. In fact, he wasn't really much of uh, anything. He worked for the museum, the American Museum of Natural History. And he was the leader of the expedition, but he had no scientific background. And what they were looking for was not dinosaurs, it was not dinosaur eggs. Back in the 1920s, they were looking for the missing link. Now the reason they thought the missing link might be here is because they had found some skeletons of Peking men not too far away from here, about 300,000 years old. And they thought perhaps the missing link between apes and humans was someplace in this neighborhood. There was a theory that uh, the animals, the mammals, had all dispersed, evolved and dispersed out of Central Asia. It was very popular at the time and they figured that if all the other mammals had, people had too. Roy had divided up his team into two segments, a uh, camel caravan that ran the supplies up to the group, and the other one was a set of Dodge cars and trucks which ran throughout the desert uh, looking for what it was that they were searching for. Now one time Roy was pretty much separated from most of the rest of his party. He was out in a vehicle by himself and uh, he happened to notice some uh, men approaching on horses with uh, with rifles. Now the only people that had rifles out here were bandits and so not knowing what else to do he hit the accelerator, charged them, firing wildly in every direction, scaring their horses and the bandits away. While this approach was successful, at least in this particular case, it does make you wonder. I wonder if those really were bandits. The expedition began to find a lot of protoceratops uh, fossils. Notice how similar these are to the griffin. It's possible that this is the origin of that animal. It's a specimen of protoceratops. This dinosaur was first discovered by Andrew's team in the 1920s. They named it Protoceratops andrewsi, Andrew's first horn. But of course, it's the dinosaur eggs that had everybody excited. And the fact of the matter is that the paleontologist that was working on the expedition uh, just about fell down the cliff uh, and accidentally ran into the, the eggs for the first time. The expedition had found so many protoceratops that it pretty quickly leaped to the conclusion that these eggs were the eggs of a protoceratops. That turns out to not always be the case. In uh, one situation, they found a 
dinosaur uh, close by the nest, but it wasn't a protoceratops. And so the expedition came to the conclusion that this dinosaur was attempting to rob the nest of a protoceratops. And so they called the animal Oviraptor, uh, egg thief. It now turns out that the eggs were not those of a protoceratops. They were instead uh, those of the Oviraptor, the animal that they thought was trying to rob the nest. Actually, it turns out to have been it was the mother uh, of the uh, of the nest trying to protect her own eggs. Roy Chapman Andrews was a great promoter and after a period of time he got himself promoted into the position of director of the American Museum. But that job unfortunately did not last long. A lot of people say that Indiana Jones was patterned after Roy Chapman Andrews and that might be true. There's one thing that everybody knows about Indiana Jones, and that is he's afraid of snakes. Roy Chapman Andrews also was terribly afraid of snakes. One time he camped out into the Gobi, and for some reason vipers started coming into the camp, coming into the tents at night. And uh, everybody was staying up all night trying to keep the vipers out. In addition to dinosaurs, Roy's expedition also found the fossils of the world's largest land mammal, the Andricotherium. Out of the darkness emerges a 12-ton giant. A fully grown male stands over 7 meters tall and weighs in at 15 tons. That's equivalent to 8 modern rhinos. No other land animal even comes close. The violence of the Soviet and uh, Chinese revolutions eventually made it impossible for Roy Chapman Andrews to continue making his expeditions. Plus, there was the Great Depression that came along and uh, the money for these kind of expeditions quickly dried up. But with the return of democracy in Mongolia and uh, a certain amount of uh, stability in the country, a number of museums have started coming back, including the American Museum. The exhibit that you're looking at it was recently discovered. It's a velociraptor made famous by Jurassic Park that's locked in a battle with a protoceratops, the kind of dinosaur that uh, Roy Chapman Andrews had, was discovering so many of. The protoceratops has the arm of the velociraptor locked in its jaws and that's how they died. Remember the raptors from Jurassic Park? They were much bigger than this velociraptor you see, a skeleton of. Jack Horner was the paleontologist advising Jurassic Park and he knew that their raptors were much too large. Well, that's at least to be uh, velociraptors anyway. But before the movie was released, paleontologists discovered Utah raptor, which is roughly the same size as the raptors in Jurassic Park. 
By the way, uh, scientists speculate that both dinosaurs were killed when a sand dune collapsed on them, and that's why the skeletons were found intact. These are protoceratops nestlings. Obviously, these were killed by some natural event, all at the same time so that they were found in the same nest. The large skeleton in this room is a tabasar. The tabasar is very closely related to Tyrannosaurus rex. As a matter of fact, it's normally considered to be within the Tyrannosaur family. One of the reasons for that is because of something unusual about Tyrannosaurus rex. It only has two fingers. The Taubasar, notice, also only has two fingers on each hand. By the way, when I was at the Flaming Cliffs, I ran into two huge owls. Uh, they had a wingspan of about five feet across, and their nests, you can see one of them here, uh, looked kind of like uh, eagle's nests. We found actually two of those nests, and we found uh, debris of hedgehogs. We believe that the owls had been eating the hedgehogs. Well, it's the end of my day at the Claiming Cliffs. Uh, I'm going to have to uh, end my conversation about Roy Chapman Andrews and dinosaurs and such. But what I would like to do now is I'd like to turn and talk to you about some of the animals that are currently living in the Gobi and, and which I ran into. Those two really big owls that I ran into were probably long-eared owls. They're the largest owls, I think, in the neighborhood. But they're not the only ones. Uh, this is a teeny little owl, a little burrowing owl, and it is officially called the Little Owl. I thought this guy was about as cute as a button, and he was very uh, uh, accommodating by letting me uh, stay and uh, watch him for about as long as I, I wanted to do that. This wasn't the only little owl that I saw. I saw another one inside a monastery. He was living kind of like a barn owl up in the, up in the rafters above the monks who were practicing their chants. In Mongolia, there are a couple of ways about getting around. One is to jump on a Mongolian pony, but out here in the desert, it makes more sense, I think, to get on a Bactrian camel. Most of the Gobi isn't covered by dunes like these, but as we focus in on the top of the dune, notice that the sand is moving. This sand dune is moving toward us. For this sort of terrain, camels must surely be the best transportation. What animal do you think made these tracks in the dune? It's this little black beetle, but they look so strange, so different, that you wouldn't have guessed it, or at least I wouldn't have guessed it was a little black beetle. Only a few miles away, there's a place called Yol Valley. Yol means vulture. In this particular case, what's really interesting is that this valley is filled with ice as late as late July. And uh, currently, uh, at the moment these photos were being taken, it was early July and there was quite a bit of ice left. In the winter, the ice builds up here very thick, as much as 
30 feet thick. And the reason it doesn't melt much during the summer, of course, is because it is in a valley, and early in the morning and late in the afternoon, the sun cannot get to the ice. Getting into this icy little valley proves a lot easier than getting out it. This is one of the commonest little animals that I saw. There must have been uh, dozens of them that I saw on the trip in various places. And uh, for the most part, they move very rapidly uh, for a few feet, and then they stop. And when they stop, they tend to be very photogenic. They seem to be, once they get used to you, quite willing to have their pictures taken. When I first saw it, I thought that it was a scorpion. Uh, because of the way that it moved and the way that its tail was held, like it is here in this particular clip. One morning when it was quite cold and the lizards were rather sluggish, I was able to catch one. And this will show you just how big this monster is. He's a teeny tiny little lizard, only about four inches long, and that includes the tail. He got so comfortable in my hand, I think he was getting warm, that he didn't want to leave. And so when I opened his ham he hand, he didn't jump out like I expected him to. And even when I lowered him all the way down to the ground, it took him a little while to decide that he wanted to leave. During bad weather, these little lizards tend to live in uh, burrows that can be about three feet underground. The males are uh, territorial, uh, and the, uh, the females produce two clutches in a year uh, up to about four eggs apiece, depending on the food supply and the rainfall. These things are said to be the uh, primary prey of the Gobi Steppe Eagle, uh, but I would think that it would take a bunch of them to make a meal. Uh, more likely, owls and smaller birds probably uh, take these things pretty often. This next little rodent is a pika. It's about the size of a guinea pig or perhaps a, a very small uh, groundhog. And I would think that uh, steppe eagles would be more interested in something about this size or a little bit bigger. I would expect that the one that you're looking at is a female uh, gathering materials for a nest. These video shots were taken in the old valley. and. Normally these things move so rapidly that you really can't get a bead on them with the camera and get any kind of good shots. But this was in along a trail and I figured that there are so many people that come down this trail so often uh, that these little pikas are pretty much used to people by now. We're moving on to some night shots that I took. Uh, I had asked the, uh, the driver uh, to stop when he saw uh, a little hopping uh, rodent that I had uh, seen and uh, that's what he's done here and I've gotten out of the vehicle and I'm walking forward to see if I can possibly identify just exactly what it is. This is quite possibly the most unusual video footage that I got on the trip. This is a long-eared Jeroboa. Uh, now they tend to stay in sand-filled valleys with uh, some low brush around them, semi-desert areas. And they're found in places where uh, the plateau is cold and high as it is here. 
The long-eared Jeroboa is layered with uh, short hair and its upper parts uh, have a combination of kind of red and yellow with the belly being kind of white while the feet tend to be covered with little bristly hairs. These are small jumping rodents. In Australia you'd call them kangaroo rats. But here there are Jeroboas and the long-eared Jeroboa can be distinguished from other Jeroboas by the enormous ears which are about a third larger than its head. Now very little is known about this species. Other Jeroboas are presumed to be primarily nocturnal. Uh, we assume that this one is as well. During the day they tend to stay in underground burrows which they dig themselves. Little owls are probably one of the most common predators of these Jeroboas. There's one thing you might find interesting. Uh, those large ears may help it to, to locate flying insects. Uh, the Jeroboas, uh, the long-eared ones at least, are capable of eating flying insects. Uh, the long-eared Jeroboa can hear uh, the insect and then jump up quickly and catch the prey while it's flying. Those uh, long ears also suggest something else, and that is that these long-eared Jeroboas are probably communicating with each other uh, using sound. Another way of communicating probably is just the same way that their uh, relatives do, and that is by engaging in something called dust bathing. Uh, there's a kind of a chemical uh, communication um, in the dust bath. This next animal is the ibex. It's a kind of uh, mountain goat. And uh, this one uh, is coming out of a cave where it had been uh, staying during the day. It's uh, getting to be uh, evening. The sun is going down. And we're very close to a watering hole. And, and that's why we stopped at this particular case, because we assumed that the goats would be coming out here. Uh, the males can uh, grow large, slightly curved horns uh, that can exceed about 24, 25 inches in length in the older animals anyway. Special hooves make them uh, excellent climbers. The, they can frequently uh, go up uh, very precipitous uh, cliff areas. They have a brown coat and a distinctive beard uh, and a silvery back. They tend to feed on grasses, shrub, and, and lichen. This is a ground squirrel in the uh, Yole Valley, uh, very close to uh, where we, we found the uh, pica that we photographed. But there is a difference between this and the pica, and that is the ground squirrel uh, does have a much more substantial tail. It's also slightly smaller. Uh, but otherwise, there are a number of similarities. This ground squirrel, uh, well, you can think of that as a prairie dog, if you like. This next animal, the locals refer to as taki but uh, you may know it better as Przewalski's horse. This animal was found uh, throughout uh, Mongolia at one time, but the last sightings of it in the wild had been about 1969 or so. Since then it was declared extinct in Mongolia. All was not lost though because uh, there were a number of uh, Taki or Przewalski horses uh, in zoos, especially in Europe. Gradually, the intent formed in Europe to reintroduce these horses into Mongolia. The first time I saw the Przewalski's horses, uh, they were uh, shown under the name of Urferda, that is, original horse. That was at the Sauberberg in Germany about 34 years ago. Conservationists didn't do so well uh, working with the communist government, but then when democracy uh, hit Mongolia back in the 1990s, uh, the environment changed quite a bit. By that time, the worldwide population of Taki had hit about 1,500. They were scattered around zoos in Australia, Germany, Switzerland, and the Netherlands. Between 1992 and 2004, the Przewalski horses were reintroduced into Mongolia at a national park. Today, there are something more than 200 horses in the national park. Given the uh, general political and logistical uh, restrictions, this has generally been considered to be miraculous. The name Przewalski's horse, as opposed to Taki, 
It comes after a, a, a Polish explorer who, who first discovered the uh, horses in uh, about 1878. Uh, I think he may have also been a Russian general of some kind. In any event, now all of the Taki or Przewalski's horses are descended from a bloodline of just three stallions. And the result is there have to be computerized bloodlines established. These are the last truly wild horses uh, left. These are the forerunners of the domestic horse, and these are the ones that you generally see depicted in cave paintings in France. Uh, these horses used to roam around all over uh, Europe as well as Asia. These are not just horses that have been allowed to become feral. This is a separate breed. Domestic horses have 64 chromosomes, whereas the Przewalski's horse has 66. Notice the dark stripe down the back. And if you focus on the legs, you can see that there's a kind of striping that reminds you of the stripes on a zebra. Przewalski's horse can crossbreed with a domestic horse, and it produces a, a crossbreed that is a fertile offspring, unlike a mule, but this fertile offspring possesses 65 chromosomes, unlike either the Przewalski's horse or the domestic horse. Now this brings up a problem. In with the Przewalski's horses, I've seen Mongolian ponies, domestic horses, and the result is that they are almost certainly inbreeding. That inbreeding could threaten the future of the Przewalski's horse in Mongolia. Today, the world population of Przewalski's horses is about 1,500. About 250 live in the wild. The absolute first European to report seeing these horses was Johann Schlittberger, who was uh, on a trip to Mongolia as a prisoner of the Mongol Khan back in the 15th century. This animal very nearly died out in 1945, because uh, there were only two zoos that held them, Munich and uh, Prague. This animal is a marmot. It's a ground bur burrowing rodent about halfway between the size of a groundhog and a beaver. When it sees a predator, it tends to take up this position. Uh, it's looking to, uh, to see what we're doing and whether or not it ought to run. Frankly, in the case of most of the Mongolian locals anyway, it ought to run. And the reason is because this thing is on the menu. If you want authentic Mongolian barbecue, this is it. And uh, what you're looking for is what in English we call blowtorched marmot. Yes, indeed. The first thing that you do is you pull out the innards. And then the carcass is stuffed full of scalding rocks. Next, the uh, neck is cinched up with wire. The bloated animal is then thrown on the fire, or uh, blowtorched, uh, to burn the fur off the outside, while the meat is cooked from within. The finished product vaguely resembles a balloon with paws. Like most things involving a blowtorch, this is uh, true man's work. Uh, incidentally, uh, this animal may be responsible for the bubonic plague, or Black Death, that covered Europe. I found this pastoral scene of uh, uh, goats and sheep at uh, sunset to be irresistible, and I started uh, filming it. H however, I was fairly close to the uh, gear, the yurt, uh, as they say in Russian, and uh, the family dogs uh, thought that I was getting a little too close. Mongolian dogs can be very aggressive, but I held my ground. The Lonely Planet Travel Guide has 10 survival phrases. The first one is, hold your dog in Mongolia. But of course, I couldn't remember it when I needed it. When I didn't back off or uh, turn, the dogs lost their courage. But the fact of the matter is, there's some really good stories about wild dogs in Mongolia and the Gobi Desert. Turns out that Roy Chapman Andrews and his wife were nearly attacked by wild dogs at, at night in the Gobi while they were sleeping. Uh, fortunately, they woke up in time, saw, saw the dogs, and uh, they shot one of them, and that drove the, the rest of them off. Maybe they could have just glowered at them like I did. But in any event, that brings us to 
the end.